uh, let me introduce myself. So, so for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is uh, is John Gould. Um, I work in in Dublin in Ireland, and um, I I'm the PI in a, in the QSIS group, which works on many different things like uh, non-equilibrium physics, quantum thermodynamics, open systems, etc. So um, during the week last week, uh, I had this idea of creating this initiative. Obviously, um, with this COVID situation. Um, currently um, in Europe and elsewhere all over the world though being a pandemic this means that you know a lot of conferences are cancelled and it's important that we keep the show going with respect to young people giving talks and everything so I just want to say uh, first of all um, you know solidarity to all of the people from Italy from Iran from China who are, who are dealing with a very serious situation in their own countries and let's hope that we prevail um, over the next few months and, and, and we come together collectively in order for us to, to sort of battle against this thing. So let's get on to science. So let me just, uh, because it's the first, um, because it's the first of hopefully many uh, online seminars, um, let me just kind of give you a rough overview of what I have in mind for this. So uh, today we have uh, Professor Gabriel Landi from Sao Paulo. So Gabriel has been, um, you know, very kind to be the first sort of guinea pig in, in, in this thing and let's see how it goes. Um, so what's going to happen in one or, one or two minutes uh, is basically uh, Gabriel's going to, going to share his screen with me, I'm going to go offline and he's going to give a presentation. Obviously we felt that the best mode uh, for this uh, presentation was that you know people couldn't really interrupt in real time, it wouldn't work with such a large number of people. Um, but what you can do is I'll mediate this. So if you want to drop some questions in the YouTube um, channel uh, chat, then I can select a few and ask Gabriel. And likewise, I think Gabriel will be very happy after the talk to take questions via email on what he's going to talk about. Um, so yeah, so 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 without further ado, um, I'll hand you over to Gabriel and we see how this goes. So thanks very much, Gabriel, for for agreeing to this um, and enjoy. Hey, hi John. Uh, hello everyone that's watching. Um, so thank you, John, for, for remember to share your screen as well, Gabriel. By the way. <laughs> yeah, I will in a second. Uh, so so thank you for for the invitation, John. Um, I think this is a very nice in initiative. I'm very happy to be the guinea pig. Uh, so let let's do this. I'm gonna try sharing my screen. Uh, so you should probably be seeing a presentation now, hopefully. Um, Okay, so, so since, since I'm the guinea pig, uh, I'll take this slowly and if there's any technical problem, we can interrupt and, and um, adjust, um, but hopefully everything is going to work. So what I'd like to talk about today is, is a work that I, I did last year, uh, which is related to two physical concepts, this idea of thermodynamic uncertainty relations and this idea of fluctuation theorem. So these are two sort of um, distinct concepts and I want to try to bring them together somehow. So, uh, this work was done in collaboration with John, uh, also with Giacomo Guarnieri, uh, who is a, is a postdoc in Dublin, and um, with Andrea Cimpanaro, who is a um, professor in mathematics uh, here in Sao Paulo. So, uh, and this, this work has been published uh, uh, around the middle of last year. So, um, let's start very slowly. So I want to start by talking about the first and the second laws of thermodynamics. So the, set, the first law is, is a rather simple law. So I'm, I'm imagining here we have some kind of system which uh, um, is composed of two baths, a hot bath and a cold bath. And you can maybe do some tasks uh, with this, such as extracting work, which is what I denote by this kind of arrow here. Now, uh, the, the first law, it essentially puts... Um, uh, uh, heat and work or heat and work on, on similar footing. It, so it says that uh, you know, the, the rate of change of the energy of the system is related to the rates at which uh, work comes in from each bath and also the rate at which, sorry, a heat comes from each bath and also the rate at which you do work. Um, however, the, not all processes in, in nature are possible. So you can in principle convert heat to work and vice versa. You can have interconversion of these resources uh, but not all of these processes are actually possible. And so it's the goal of the second law to determine which processes are physically possible or not. So um, the second law, it essentially is related to this idea of entropy and the very important fact that entropy does not satisfy a continuity equation. So what does this mean? It means that um, if you have a system which can exchange some entropy 
with the environment, there is a flow of entropy. You can you can identify a, a flow of entropy between system and environment, which is usually given by this uh, Clausius expression here, uh, which is the, the, the heat divided by temperature of the bath. However, uh, in addition to this flow of entropy, you can also have some entropy that is produced within the system. So that's what it means when I say that it doesn't satisfy a continuity equation. So essentially, the rate at which the entropy of the system changes is related to the flow of entropy to different baths. But also there's a, diff a new term here, which is called the entropy production or entropy production rate. Uh, and this guy is, uh, the represents the entropy that is just spontaneously produced in the process, uh, meaning that it doesn't flow from anywhere, it's just it's produced in the process. And, and now the second law can be, can be very neatly formulated as just a single statement that the entropy production is non-negative. So um, um, essentially, and this entropy production is, is indeed a, a production, right? It, it produces, um, uh, and it's always positive because it's, uh, it's a production, that's what I mean. Um, okay. So, so now I would like to talk a little bit about why this matters, why this idea of entropy production is, is meaningful. And so what I would like to do is I want to go through a, a couple of examples uh, and show how, how this idea of, of the, that the entropy production is always non-negative, how this can be used to make predictions about uh, thermodynamic processes. So I'm again imagining a system which is composed of two baths and that you can maybe extract some work from it. And so the, the first and second laws can be written together like this. You have the energy balance and you have the entropy balance. And I'm going to assume that this engine is operating in some kind of steady state regime. Uh, so that, you know, in the steady state, the, the energy of the system and the entropy of the system is no longer changing. So the UDT is zero, the SDT is zero. But this, this doesn't mean that uh, nothing is happening. Things are happening. In particular, there's heat flowing, there's work going on, there's entropy being produced and so on. It's just that in the steady state, these things, they balance out. So all the heat that uh, enters from the bath is converted into work and, and vice versa. Now let's talk about the efficiency of this engine. So uh, the efficiency is defined as the rate at which you do work divided by the rate at which you, um, heat flows from the hot bath. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these two equations to, uh, um, um, in this formula for the efficiency. So first I use the, uh, the first law, and so I eliminate W dot uh, and write it in terms only of the, the two heats, Q cold and Q hot. And now I use the second law uh, to eliminate Q cold. And so I get something like this. So what we see is that the, the efficiency of the engine is, uh, contains two terms. The first term is exactly the Carnot efficiency. So this is just the, the Carnot efficiency, eta Carnot. And this, this other term is always negative. It's negative because the entropy production is positive. So you see, uh, the entropy production is actually the reason why the efficiency of any engine is smaller than Carnot efficiency. Uh, we don't reach Carnot because we produce some entropy, right? And so entropy production gives us this idea of irreversibility because we know that, you know, Carnot is associated with a reversible engine. But a real engine, it always produces some entropy, and so we never really reach Carnot. We're always a little bit below Carnot. And so this, what we uh, just discussed mathematically here, can actually be written in words as a Carnot state, statement of the second law. The efficiency of a quasi-static or reversible Carnot cycle depends only on the temperature of the two heat reservoirs and is the same whatever the working substance. A Carnot engine operated in this way is the most efficient, efficient possible engine using those two temperatures. So this is essentially um, uh, saying in words what we just derived. And I like this very much because I always hated these kinds of uh, statements of the second law, which you have to read through and kind of interpret them and so on. I I'm very much prefer that you can just write down an equation to, uh, um, which has the, the same meaning, but it, it's much more direct. So I, 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 I like very much this idea of writing um, the efficiency in terms of the entropy production. Okay, uh, we, we can keep going. So uh, we can also talk about the second law uh, in the context where there is no work. So, so imagine that you have now just a system and there's a, a hot bath and a cold bath, and we just observe heat flow, right? Uh, now, in this case, the second law is just going to read uh, in the steady state uh, that, you know, Q hot minus Q hot over T hot minus Q cold over T cold has to be larger or equal to zero. So this is the second law here. But if there is no work involved, then the, the heat that flows to the cold bath must equal the heat coming from the hot bath. 
And so substituting this in this equation, we get that, uh, this expression. So now uh, this is expression, the, the fact that sigma is always non-negative is essentially saying that heat will f flow from hot to cold. So it's saying that since T hot is larger than T cold, then this guy is going to be uh, positive. And so this guy also has to be positive. So heat flows from hot to cold. And so this is uh, the Clausius statement of the second law. Heat can never pass from a colder to a warmer body without some other change connected therewith occurring at the same time. So it's again a different way of viewing another statement of the second law uh, using only the fact that sigma dot is non-negative. Um, and finally, one last example, let's suppose that we only have a hot bath, there's not, no, no cold bath anymore, but we can do some work. So then the first law uh, is essentially going to relate the, the work rate with the heat rate to the hot bath. And so the second law is going to give sigma dot is minus q, uh, q hot dot over t hot, and just substituting for the first law, we get this expression. Now, uh, in, in my definition, the way I, I am defining things, when the work is positive, it means that an external agent is doing work on the system, right? And so essentially, this is going to be the Calvin Planck statement of the second law. It is impossible to devise a cyclically operating device, the sole effect of which is to absorb energy in the form of heat from a single bath and to deliver an equivalent amount of work, right? So essentially, the second law, let me go back one second, is saying that work has to be hot which means that you cannot extract work from a single bath. So again, we have a, another statement of the second law following from the non-negativity of the entropy production. Okay, um, now I want to talk about how these things change when we go to small scales, to nanoscale or microscopic scales in general. So the, this, this video here is essentially showing someone uh, folding and unfolding a kind of a bead or something. Now. Um, Imagine that we do this experiment of, uh, you know, stretching uh, this bead, but we do this with a molecule, right? We do this with, for instance, an RNA molecule. Um, then this process requires some work, right? Every time we stretch um, uh, or every time we compress this, this molecule, uh, there is some work associated to it. But an RNA molecule is going to be special because it suffers Brownian motion, right? So the, the, the very molecule is always fluctuating a little bit because it's in some fluid, um, in some liquid, and this liquid is always um, uh, colliding with the molecule, and so there's like this um, endless fluctuations at the Brownian motion, right? So every time we repeat this process, we're going to get something different because sometimes, because of these fluctuations, the molecule will be a little bit more compressed, a little bit more stretched, and so on. And so in the end, the amount of work we need to do is going to be a little bit different each time, right? And so this means that when we go to the, to the, to the nanoscale, um, statements about thermodynamics have to be made uh, in the sense of random variables. Work is now a random variable, and so we can associate a probability distribution, P of W, to work. This is now the, the, the big change in, in paradigm uh, when we go from classical thermodynamics to uh, microscopic thermodynamics. All thermodynamic quantities, they become random, random variables with an associated probability distribution. Now here's an example in, with RNA molecules. So this was done in 2005. Um, and what they show here is essentially the probability distribution of work in different kinds of folding and unfolding processes. So what they do is they use these optical tweezers to um, 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 pinch both sides of an RNA molecule and then they can just you know, stretch or compress the, uh, the molecule, and they can do this many times and collect some statistics. So, so at, at each time they do it, they get a different amount of work, and then from these statistics, they obtain um, a probability distribution of work. <clears throat> now, here's also another example in the quantum uh, uh, scenario. So this is from 2014, and also shows the distribution of work, but now in um, a, a qubit system, um, using um, nuclear magnetic resonance. So in this case, there is a fundamental difference, which is that uh, in the quantum case, work is um, discrete. So the probability distribution of work is a series of uh, sharp peaks. So work can either be have uh, this value, or the work can be this value, or this value, or this value. So, but each time you, you do the experiment, the amount of work that you need to do fluctuates. Um, the exact same idea also applies to heat. 
so imagine that we talk about the heat exchange between two systems. For instance, you you can have like two buckets of water or something like that. Now in this case, you know uh, these objects they just exchange heat. You put them in contact with each other, and heat just flows from the hot to cold. There's nothing special uh, happening. However, if our system is now two harmonic oscillators, then this is different because you can imagine that you have one harmonic oscillator that is uh, coupled to some kind of hot bath and one harmonic oscillator coupled to a cold bath. And so because of these baths, these guys, they are uh, naturally fluctuating. Um, they just keep wiggling around. And so when you couple them together, imagine that, you know, at T equals zero, you couple this guy uh, and you allow them to exchange some heat. As soon as you couple them, they may be on different states. And so the amount of heat that they're going to exchange is going to be different. And so once again, heat um, is going to fluctuate and will therefore also be described by a probability distribution of heat. Now, this experiment was also done. This is 2011. Uh, uh, the experiment they did was with a, a levitating uh, microparticle uh, in, 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 a, in a gel. And this is the, the plot of the probability distribution of, of heat. Um, the plot is on log scale, so that's why it looks a little bit different. But this is essentially P of Q. Uh, and you see that you know, there are fluctuations in the amount of heat that uh, this particle can exchange with the environment. And also, uh, very much more recently, this, uh, an experiment was done in uh, nuclear magnetic resonance again. Um, um, and so here, they, they show a situation where heat uh, is all, also quantized, so heat can take on the values either minus 1, 0, or 1 uh, uh, with these probabilities. So it's, again, the same idea that, you know, mic at the microscopic level, thermodynamic quantities, they, they fluctuate. Okay, so now we come to the question, which uh, is, what are the consequences of these fluctuations? You know, what kinds of consequences uh, follow from the fact that in, in the microscopic regime, thermodynamic quantities fluctuate? Now, I'm going to talk about two of them, fluctuation theorems and thermodynamic uncertainty relations. I'll explain both of them uh, in detail, and then I'll show that they are actually connected to each other. That's going to be the main goal of this talk. So we start with uh, fluctuation theorems. So uh, here's the idea. Uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, we have these probability distributions of thermodynamic quantities, but they are not arbitrary. They must satisfy a special symmetry. The, the, the P of W and the P of Q, they cannot just be arbitrary distributions. So for instance, in the case of work, uh, you have something of the following form. Now, he, here uh, on the numerator is the probability of uh, a, a process, P of W, and this F means forward. So it's essentially the probability, for instance, that you fold a uh, um, protein uh, RNA molecule. And this is divided by the probability that, uh, of the backward process, which is the, the time-reversed version of the forward one. So if PF is folding, then P, PB is unfolding. And you see, if you compare PF of W with PB of minus W, they cannot be arbitrary. But actually, they are related by something very special, which is uh, the, the amount of work that you need to do the, minus the, free, the difference in free energy of the system. So this is a special symmetry for these probability distributions. In the case of heat, you get also get something similar, but you actually get something a little bit more special. So now um, you again have the ratio of probabilities, but what is special about heat is that it's actually the same probability distribution here. So it's P of Q and the same probability of minus Q. The, these guys, the ratio between them, have to be related to the exponential of the heat Q times the difference in temperatures, the uh, 1 over Tc minus 1 over T hot. So, um, yeah, so as I mentioned, in the case of work, we have uh, forward and backward processes, but in the case of heat, uh, both of them coincide, and so we have just the same probability distribution here in um, the numerator and the denominator. Um, we can also sort of write these in a more unified way uh, if we introduce the idea of entropy production. Now, for each kind of process, uh, the, the, the shape of the entropy production is different. So it's kind of a, um, one has to identify what quantity is represented by the entropy production. In the case of work, the entropy production is essentially beta W minus delta F, which is the guy that appears here in the exponent. And so if you write instead a, a fluctuation theorem for the 
entropy production, uh, the probability distributions of sigma, not of W, you're going to get this form. So the probability of getting an entropy production sigma in the forward process and minus sigma in the backward is related to each of the sigma. And now we get something analogous to uh, for heat. So for heat, again, uh, the entropy production is, is defined as the guy in the exponent here. And so uh, this fluctuation theorem can be written like this. It's P of sigma divided by P of minus sigma times e to the sigma. And so uh, let me just call attention that this kind of, if, if we compare the two formulas, if we compare this uh, with this, the, the formula for the, uh, in the case of heat, it's, it's much more, um, uh, it's, it's, the symmetry is much stronger, right? I mean, if we think about this mathematically, uh, this is essentially a restriction on a probability distribution, on the function P of sigma. So it's essentially saying that the function cannot be arbitrary, but must satisfy this special symmetry. Whereas here, we're comparing two probability distributions. We're saying that there is one probability and another one, and they have to be related to each other. So this case, which is more generically known by this name of exchange fluctuation theorem, is, is much stronger kind of symmetry. Sometimes this also happens in the case of work. There are some processes where um, uh, the backward and the forward uh, distributions are the same, even in this case of work, but that depends on, on the problem in question. Now, um, there have also been plenty of experimental confirmation of these fluctuation theorems. So this is the RNA molecule experiment I mentioned before. And uh, there's also the way to plot this is actually, if you allow me to go back one second. So yeah, here you see, um, if we plot the log of the probabilities, the log of these guys is going to be a function that is linear in W. So essentially the log of PF over PB is, is gives you a measure, it should be linear if the fluctuation theorem is to hold. And this is what we find, uh, what is found here. So uh, you see this is the log of, um, PU over PR, um, uh, well, PF over PB, it's the same thing. Uh, and you see that it's, it's a straight line as a function of W. And this has also been done for this experiment in, in um, the NMR setup for quantum systems. And so here is W, and here is the ratio of the probabilities in log scale. And so again, you see a straight line. And finally, this is the uh, verification in the case of heat. So uh, the ratio log of P of Q um, log of P of Q divided by P of minus Q, the authors here call this a row, All right? So it's, it's this guy. Uh, and so you see that again, it's, it's a straight line. So this is just to say that, you know, we can have plenty of experimental confirmations of these fluctuation theorems. Now, now these fluctuation theorems, they are deemed uh, quite fundamental. They are perhaps one of the most important discoveries in uh, statistical physics in the, in the last decades, because they really show a fundamental symmetry of thermodynamics uh, and uh, thermal processes. And now we, we, we get to the second kind of, um, a se second aspect of fluctuations that I want to talk about, which is this idea of thermodynamic uncertainty relations. So uh, the idea, again, is to consider some process, and here I'm using as an example heat flow from hot to cold. And the, the, the focus of the TURs is to look not only at the average heat, nor the probability of heat. It's actually to look at the variance of heat. So um, it, the TUR is essentially a statement on uh, the variance of the amount of heat that flows between two systems. Uh, or more precisely, on, on um, this, this ratio here of the variance divided by the mean squared, uh, which is called uh, the precision. So it's the, the precision of the thermodynamic quantity. And, and the TOR is essentially a bound on this. It's a bound relating the precision to the entropy production. So it says that the average entropy production, it um, not only uh, affects uh, mean quantities like the uh, efficiency that we discussed before, but it also affects uh, the fluctuations of these quantities. Now, this, this uh, bound is, is very simple and very elegant, but, and, but also very powerful. So it's uh, very nice. And it's also counterintuitive in, in a sense, because you see, uh, it depends, it's inversely proportional to sigma. So what this is saying is that uh, if you want to uh, reduce the fluctuations, you actually have to increase the entropy production. Right? Um, more irreversible processes fluctuate less. That's the idea. 
Uh, but the derivation of this, which was done in this paper by Andrea Barato and Udo Seifert, uh, it involved only classical Markov processes, uh, and it can be violated in many scenarios. So this, this began in the search for, for um, other kinds of TURs and other forms of uh, TURs, uh, which are, can hold in more general scenarios. Now, before getting into that, I just want to comment on some of the implications that the TUR have. Uh, because as I mentioned, this is a very powerful kind of uh, inequality because it really gives a valuable insight into um, uh, thermodynamics of small systems. And so in this paper by Piazonka and Seifert, they, they discussed uh, a, an implication of this in the case of an engine. So uh, um, in, in an engine, the output power is essentially the work rate, is the work done uh, by unit time. Uh, and you can also derive an entirely analogous TUR for the work rate. So it's essentially that the variance of work divided by the works, uh, average work squared is larger than 2 over sigma. And now what we can do is this. So uh, before we derived this formula relating the efficiency um, to the kernel efficiency and the entropy production. And But now this when we derived this formula, we're still thinking about classical thermodynamics. So we didn't have to worry about the fact that things fluctuate. So let's now rewrite it, but taking into account the fluctuation. So I put averages here and here, ju just to be uh, sure that you know this is now the average entropy production, the average heat, and so on. And now we substitute this expression here. And so what we get is that is this, the, the, the precision of work is essentially related only to the heat to the cold bath. And now what we do is, is the following. So to finish, we uh, express, we, we eliminate this guy uh, by substituting for the efficiency uh, as being the average work divided by the average heat. And so what we finally get is this. So this is a bound relating the fluctuations of the output power to the average output power and the efficiency of the machine. And this bound is very, very nice. So you see, uh, suppose we want to operate some machine at fixed power, right? Uh, we fix this guy, so for, I don't know, 50 watts or something. Then uh, if we want to improve the efficiency of our machine, if we want to get closer to Carnot, then you see that this guy is going to become larger and larger, and so the, the, the variance is going to increase. So um, if you want to operate very close to Carnot efficiency for a fixed power, you pay a price, which is that the fluctuations can become very large. right? And I think this is quite interesting because it goes against everything we learn in undergraduate thermodynamics. Essentially, we always learn that reversible is better, right? But if you're in the nanoscale, fluctuations can be very bad. I mean, you can imagine a machine that fluctuates a lot, then maybe, I, I, I don't know, it can be a very bad thing. And so if you want to curb these fluctuations, you actually have to operate your machine more irreversibly, which I think is, is quite counterintuitive. Now, um, we can also talk a little bit about this in the um, um, in the case of cyclic engines. So, for instance, here's an auto cycle, right? Uh, and you're interested again in the output power. Now, suppose you want to just approach Carnot efficiency. So, you want to have the efficiency as close as possible to Carnot. Uh, and we saw that we can do this if we put the average entropy production to zero, right? So, if the engine is more and more reversible, then um, uh, the efficiency will become closer and closer to Carnot efficiency. But, however, to do this, we have to run the cycle uh, more and more slowly, right? Because uh, we want to make it as reversible as possible. And so usually the output power is going to go to zero, right? So uh, uh, the common idea is that if you want to operate an engine at Carnot efficiency, it will operate with zero output power because the engine has to take an infinite time to operate, and so the power you get out from it is zero. Now, uh, a, a possible um, alternative to this was proposed in this paper by Michele Campisi and Rosario Fazio in 2016, where they discussed an engine uh, where the working fluid is actually um, um, a critical system, right? So, so it's a system that undergoes a second order phase transition. Uh, and they show that for this kind of system, uh, it is possible to approach Carnot efficiency at finite power. So you can operate arbitrarily close to Carnot efficiency at finite power without sacrificing the power. Now, this is very nice, but now the TURs, they actually um, give an explanation for all of this, because essentially uh, we know that if we want to 
operate with fixed power uh, and we want to be very close to kernel efficiency, that the, the, the price we pay is that the fluctuations have to be very large. And this is exactly what happens in a critical engine, in a, in a critical system, sorry. Uh, because in a critical system, we know that at, at, the, uh, at the vicinity of the critical point, the fluctuations are very large. So uh, again, you can operate with finite power close to kernel efficiency, but you pay a price. You pay a price that the fluctuations can be very large. And so I think that neither of these questions are, uh, are, not, uh, are obvious, because essentially you're introducing now the fluctuations as, as, as an additional ingredient in the characterization of a thermodynamic system, right? Not only you have to talk about average power, average heat, and so on, now you have to take into account fluctuations when designing an engine at the nanoscale. Um, so just to mention these thermodynamic uncertainty relations, they received quite some um, uh, interest last year in particular. So there has been this, this review, um, uh, perspective, sorry, uh, from Horowitz and, and Ging Gingrich uh, on TURs. And there has also been two experimental papers uh, um, uh, showing these TURs. One of them was in a uh, quantum dot system and the other one was in an NMR system. And both of them discussed the um, the fluctuations um, and how they relate to the entropy production. Okay, and now finally I reached the, 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 the bulk of this talk, which is the contribution that we did, uh, which was to show that there is a TUR which follows from fluctuation theorems. So the, the symmetry that I, I talked about of the fluctuation theorems, the special symmetry, it actually implies a TUR. Now, um, Wait, sorry, this part is, yeah. So essentially, uh, sorry about that. So um, as, as I mentioned before, um, most fluctuation theorems, they have this form, which involve a forward and a backward distribution. Uh, but here, um, we're actually gonna focus on the exchange fluctuation theorem. So, so the fluctuation theorems, which have, as I mentioned, uh, this stronger symmetry, where uh, it's both, the, it's the same probability that appears here and here. Uh, now, in this case, motivated by the symmetry, uh, what we first did was we proved the following theorem. Uh, so, sorry, yeah. So this is the theorem that we proved. Um, suppose we have a system, any system, and we fix the average, so we fix the first moment. Now we ask, um, what kind of probability distribution satisfying uh, the fluctuation theorem, p to the sigma by p to the minus sigma is e to the sigma, with a fixed average, which one has the smallest possible variance, right? We call this the minimal distribution. Is that is from all probability distributions, which one has the smallest variance uh, for a fixed average? And the answer is a distribution with only two points in the support. So essentially, either the uh, entropy production can take a value a, or it can take a value minus a. Right? And this number A is fixed by the average. So uh, if, for, if we fix this guy, then this implicitly fix the value of A. Moreover, the, the variance of this distribution is given by the mean squared times a function E of sigma, F of E of sigma. And this function is, is a little bit ugly. It's the hyperbolic cosecant squared uh, of G of X over 2, where G is the inverse function of X hyperbolic tangent of X. Right? So this function may look a little bit ugly at first, but it's actually pretty good. So here it's plotted compared to 2 over x. Now, the reason why I compare it to 2 over x is because if this has the, the similar form to the original bound, which maybe I can even rewrite it here. So the original bound was that the variance of sigma divided by the average of sigma squared had to be 2 over sigma. Right? So that's why I'm comparing um, our function f of x here with 2 over sigma. Uh, and you see that it's pretty, the two functions are, are actually pretty close, uh, but very importantly, our function is always smaller than 2 over x, right? This is going to be very important. Um, so, and just, just go, coming back to the, the theorem, since we found the minimal distribution, which is a distribution that has the smallest possible variance, then this means that any other process in nature must have a variance larger than this one. Right? So this gives us the bound. We know the minimal process, and so we know that any process in nature has to have a larger variance. And so this is our TUR. Now, um, one thing which is very nice about this TUR is that it's tight. Um, and we know exactly which process saturates it, because we know the minimal distribution. 
Now, the reason why we feel this is important is because around the same time, there appeared many papers uh, discussing similar ideas uh, and similar um, um, bounds on the TOR coming from fluctuation theorems. But they, they all uh, discuss um, a bound where the function f of x is given by this function. And now this function, admittedly, is much simpler to deal with uh, than, than uh, our strange function f of x, but this bound is always looser than ours. This function is always below our f of x. And so this bound is never tight. It can never be saturated because uh, uh, we know what the minimal distribution is, and so no process can have a variance smaller than the minimal variance. Okay, uh, now what the theorem I showed is a simplified version, um, but you can actually generalize it to more complicated cases of systems involving multiple thermodynamic charges. So you can imagine you have some arbitrarily complicated thermodynamic system, which is characterized by some charges, Q1, Qn, and so on. Now the charge can be uh, heats, uh, works, and so on. And we assume that this system satisfies a, an exchange fluctuation theorem. So the joint probability distribution of all the Q1, Qn, divided by the joint distribution of minus Q1, minus Qn, etc., is the exponential of a linear function in the Q. So this is a linear function with some coefficients, ai, and these ai, they are called the affinities, right? So, so you have affinities times charges. Now, in this case, the entropy production is just the uh, sum, is, the, is again the guy that appears in the exponent, is the sum of the charges times uh, the affinities. So just to give you an example, uh, there is this very nice heat engine fluctuation theorem, which was derived in this paper by Michele Campisi, Yuka Pecola, and Rosario Fazio, which is uh, essentially a fluctuation theorem for an engine involving the heat to the hot bath and the work. And so in this case, you get an, ex an exchange fluctuation theorem, and the affinity associated with the heat to the hot bath is beta hot minus beta cold, and the affinity associated with work is beta cold. Uh, now, in this case, what we actually obtain is a matrix-valued bound. So now we don't have a bound on the variance of the charges. We actually have a bound on the covariance matrix, Cij. Uh, and so the bound is essentially saying that this matrix C minus uh, uh, the function f, which is a C number, times this matrix Q, Q transpose, where Q is the vector of averages, now, this entire matrix has to be positive semi-definite. So uh, we obtain a constraint that on the positive semi-definiteness of this matrix. Now, what does this mean? Well, when a matrix is positive semi-definite, it implies that the diagonal entries are positive, are, are non-negative, right? So, so this bound immediately implies a TOR for all the thermodynamic charges. Uh, so all the QI, they are bound by the same kind of F of E of sigma. But in addition, uh, the fact that the matrix is positive semi-definite also imposes constraints on the um, uh, covariances between the thermodynamic quantities. So the covariances are very nice because uh, they're essentially giving an idea of the correlations between thermodynamic variables, right? Uh, uh, how is heat to the hot bath correlated with work and, and so on? Now, what is particularly important about covariances is uh, the sign. Now, if the covariance is positive, it means that if one uh, variable is above average, there is a tendency for the other one to also be above average. And if it's negative, then when one is above average, the other one has a tendency to be below average, right? So the sign is very important. Are they positively correlated or negatively correlated? Now, what we find from this bound is a criteria uh, establishing the sign of the covariances. And the criteria is that if uh, this inequality is satisfied, which is an inequality involving only the, the precisions, um, variances divided by averages, then it's guaranteed that the sign of the covariances will be equal to the sign of the product of the thermodynamic quantity, so uh, of the averages, sorry. So the sign of the covariances equals the sign of the product of the averages. Uh, so, so this is showing that the fluctuation theorems, not only do they impose constraints on the variance of thermodynamic quantities, but they also impose constraints on the covariances. And I, I personally find the covariances very interesting. Uh, I think it's something that hasn't been explored in, in detail in, in um, quantum thermodynamics and stochastic thermodynamics. And um, um, I particularly uh, like this idea of talking about correlations between thermodynamic quantities. I think it's very nice.
Okay, uh, now to finish, let me give you an example, uh, which is this, um, the swap engine, which was introduced in this paper uh, by Michele. So the swap engine is perhaps the simplest engi engine one can imagine. It's composed of two qubits, uh, each connected to its own bath, hot bath and a cold bath. Uh, and what is essential is that the two qubits, they have different gaps. So uh, one qubit has a gap EA and the other one has a gap EB. Now the engine actually operates in two strokes. So in the first stroke, uh, the, the qubits which are initially thermal, they, they undergo a swap operation. So one applies a swap unitary and just exchanges the states of the two qubits. And then in the second stroke, uh, the qubits are allowed to thermalize again with the bath. So during the swap, there is no bath. We cut off these, these connections. And so there's only this unitary swap. And then there, in the other stroke, there is no unitary, just the thermalization with the respective paths. So it's a two-stroke engine alternating between unitary and uh, thermalization, unitary and thermalization. Now, this is the um, average values of heat uh, to the hot bath, cold bath, and work for this um, engine. It depends only on the gaps, e epsilon A and epsilon B, and on the corresponding Fermi-Dirac distributions. So you see, quite crucially, that in order for there to be work, the gaps have to be different. So if, if they are resonant, the swap requires no work. You can swap two qubits uh, at zero energy cost if the qubits are resonant. But when they're not resonant, there's a work cost associated with the swap. Now, uh, what is also very nice about this engine is that it can operate on uh, different regimes, depending essentially on the ratio of the gaps between uh, uh, the two qubits. Now, uh, depending on how this ratio compares with the ratio of temperatures, this engine can operate either as a refrigerator, an engine, or an accelerator. Now, in the refrigerator case, uh, you uh, inject energy to make heat flow from cold to hot. In the engine, heat flows the natural way and you get something out of it. And in the accelerator, heat also flows in the natural way, but you inject some energy to make it flow more. And uh, just by changing the, gap, the ratio of the gaps, you can operate on any regime. And this is shown in this plot, where we uh, show the average work, the average heat to the hot bath, and also the average entropy production here in gray. In addition, this engine also satisfies a fluctuation theorem. As I mentioned before, it's this engine fluctuation theorem. So this means that our bond applies, and now we can study the fluctuations of thermodynamic quantities. So here's an example where I plot the fluctuations of the heat to the hot bath. Uh, and this is shown in black, and our bound is shown in orange here. And so you see that our bound is always below the black curve. Just for comparison, we also show the original TUR here in green, just to show that this guy can actually be violated in this region. Now, of course, the fact that it's violated is it's not really an issue because uh, this bound was derived in a different scenario. There is no reason for it to apply to our scenario as well. Uh, and in fact, in many um, regimes, it applies rather well. But it's just to say that you know, this bound can, in principle, be violated, whereas our bound can never be violated because we know the minimal process. I mean, we know the minimal distribution and the minimal process that satisfies this. Uh, here are also plots for the variance of work and also for the covariances between heat and work. What is particularly interesting is that uh, for both the refrigerator and the engine, the covariances are negative, and then in the accelerator, the covariances are positive. Now, we don't know if this is a general feature of uh, all heat engines, but it, it is an interesting open question, in my opinion. Um, now, this, there has been recently, uh, very recently, an experimental study of these TURs, uh, in an NMR setup where they essentially um, study heat flow between two qubits. And um, here's, here are the results. So what we see here is the precision is plotted in, in, in purple, this guy here, right? And this is compared with the three bounds. So this is the original bound, this is the exponential bound, and this is the uh, uh, our tour de force bound with the function f. So you see that uh, the exponential bound is always below ours. Um, and also that the original bound in red can actually be violated. So you have a region where the purple uh, is below the red one, right? And so I think this is a neat illustration of, of um, um, these kinds of bounds in, in a quantum system. Uh, and finally, um, I would like to address just a question. So uh, just recalling the theorem, essentially the theorem goes as follows. 
um, we consider all kinds of processes, so all kinds of probability distributions which satisfy a fluctuation theorem and have a fixed average where E of sigma is fixed, some number. And then we ask which one has the smallest possible variance, and the answer is a distribution with only two points. Now, what one may naturally ask from this is, is this process realizable? I mean, can one actually in nature realize such a process? Now, the, the answer is that this process is realizable asymptotically, right? I mean, th there's likely not a single process in nature which gives exactly this. But the idea is that this gives us guidelines on how to choose a certain process. So we want to, if you want to minimize the fluctuations, we have to choose a process such that it's as close as possible to these two delta peaks. So maybe something like two Gaussians or something, right? So this gives us, the idea is that this optimization procedure is giving guidelines on uh, how to find the optimal processes, the, the ideal situation. Okay, so uh, with this I reach my conclusions. So I talked about fluctuation theorems and TURs, and I showed that uh, the TUR, a TUR can be viewed as a consequence of fluctuation theorems. Now, uh, I think that this is important. The reason is, first, because it sheds light on the origins of the TUR, on the physical origins, um, and second, because it shows that the fluctuation theorem actually contains information about the second moments as well. It's very common to associate the fluctuation theorems with uh, uh, statements about the, the average, the first moment, through Jensen's inequality. But uh, this, our results show that uh, the fluctuation theorems also contain information about the second moments. Uh, and finally, this introduces the idea of a minimal process, which I think is very nice. It's this idea of um, looking over all possible thermodynamic processes and wondering which one uh, has the smallest possible uh, variance or which one optimizes some kind of uh, task. Uh, okay, so with this I conclude. Uh, so I just want to finish with um, a picture of my group. So I forgot to mention I'm stationed in Sao Paulo, uh, at the University of Sao Paulo, and this is... is um, my group, this picture is a little bit outdated, but not too much. And so thank you all very much. I hope this worked. Gabriel, that was uh, brilliant. So if you don't mind just uh, to take off uh, the screen share, um, I'll join in. Um, yeah. Let me see how I can do this. Um, yeah, that was, that, was, that was really brilliant, Gabriel. We, we really appreciate um, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you coming around and, and, and doing that because I guess um, now most people um, they're working in faculty are currently in the process of converting you know frantically their lectures to online mode and it's not an easy task for anyone so we really appreciate that so just before we get to um, just before we get to some questions which can be written in the in the comments section of YouTube I just want to reiterate again that uh, you know please share the link um, to anyone that you think might be might be interested um, obviously, the emphasis will be on thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, but I have in mind uh, the idea to um, uh, to extend out, let's say, the mm, you know the invitation to more pedagogical introductions coming from the outside of this community, so as not to become insular. In particular, we really appreciate more interest from senior members of the community to give talks. I think that would be really nice, especially for younger members, and also experimentalists are, are encouraged as well. So without, without ado, um, thanks a lot again, uh, Gabriel, and um, let me just take questions from the YouTube channel for five minutes or so. As I said, questions can be asked via email um, as well. So any questions there, guys? Just waiting on it. No worries. I have one. I can, I can, I can give you one. There was one a while back from, from Archak uh, during the talk. So Archak was, was asking the following question. He said, what does it mean that the expression for entropy production is different for work fluctuation theorem and the heat fluctuation theorem? Right. So the way I view it is that entropy production is, is not really an observable. Uh, um, it's something that has to be related to observables given a physical theory. So for each kind of theory that you one puts up for thermodynamics, one has to identify which objects can be associated with entropy production. Uh, now, in the case where you only have work, for instance, then the entropy production is given by one formula, but if you only have heat exchange, then it's a different expression. And this also changes if you go, for instance, to different kinds of theories, like if you go to uh, classical Messer equations, you can have one formulation of entropy production, but if you go to 
uh, Fokker-Planck equations or Lindblad equations, they're going to have different formulations. So the idea, at least the, the way I view it, is that the game is, um, given a physical theory, how to identify the object that it represents the entropy projection. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Gabriel. Um, so another thing with respect to the questions there, guys, is that um, I'd appreciate if you're hiding behind some sort of a synonym for your name. Can you state your name? I'm not going to ask Gabriel a question unless you state your name, just in the interest of trying to prevent trolling, etc. So we have, a, we have a couple of other questions. We've one from Fabio Anza. So uh, Fabio asks, how restrictive is the assumption to work on the exchange fluctuation theorem instead of the full Crookes relation? Right. Uh, it, it is somewhat restrictive. I mean, it's fine if you want to talk about heat exchange. It's also fine if you want to talk about some, some kinds of uh, work processes which have the symmetry, but it, it is a little bit restrictive. We are currently working on, on extending this to the full Crookes relation, uh, but there are uh, several technical difficulties. It's not as simple as, as, um, as we were hoping. So, so, yeah, it is a little bit restrictive, um, uh, but there are, nonetheless, a, a class of processes for which this holds. Uh, thanks a lot, Gabriel. Again, um, another question there uh, coming in from um, uh, Prasanna is, uh, could you please summarize the central assumption required to derive the tour de force? Right, right. So so the, the, the only assumption that we did was what was formulated in the theorem. Essentially, we just it's fully mathematical. There is no physics in the theorem. It's just given a probability distribution, P of sigma, any probability, which has which satisfies the fluctuation theorem, the exchange fluctuation theorem. Then for a fixed average, which distribution out of all distributions minimizes the variance? So essentially the way we did this, uh, the way the theorem is proved, is first we compute the average, we compute the variance, sorry, for a distribution that has two points in the support, then we compute it for a distribution that has three points in the support, uh, and show that it's always larger than if you only have two points, then we do it for four points. I uh, show that it's always larger than if you have two points. And then we have an analytical continuation method that allows us to generalize three and four points to an arbitrary number of points. And so we just conclude that, you know, out of all probability distributions that we want, even continuous ones, you can never have uh, a variance smaller than a two-point distribution. That, so that's, that's why it's really a tour de force. It's very direct proof. So, so maybe uh, take one or two more questions. Um, there's a question coming in there from BJ. Uh, he asks, what happens to the transient TUR in the long time limit? What happens to the transient TUR? Um, so that, that's a good question. Um, so in principle, the, the, the TUR that was shown here, it holds for arbitrary time. So, so um, um, the heat that appears there is the heat that has been exchanged up to a certain amount of time. So one could have written Q of T everywhere, for instance, and it holds for arbitrary times. Now, um, if the two systems are microscopic, then this heat is going to fluctuate and so on. But if the systems are macroscopic, uh, then the heat flow is going to eventually build up and become very large, right? And then in this case, uh, the, this bound becomes trivial because essentially the variance is going to become very small sort of by um, kind of a law of large numbers argument. Um, so, so this bound is, is more ideally suited for small systems. Okay, perfect. I think, I think we, can, we can wrap it up there. Um, I just want to thank again the audience for tuning in. We had over 110 in the audience, which was amazing. Um, Gabrielle, for such a clear uh, talk. Hold on, we have one more question from Devira Segal. So let's just finish with that, okay? So uh, Devira asks, your derivation does not rely on Markovianity, but we know that the regular TUR relies on that. Do you understand the special role of Markovianity from your general TUR? That's a really good question. Yeah, it is a really good question, and unfortunately the we answer don't is the answer, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is something we're trying to look into, kind of how to bridge the two worlds. It's a it's, um, work in progress, but yeah, it's a very good question, which I have no idea how to answer. Okay, so let's 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 uh, let's finish up on, on on that as a kind of open question for the community. Um, so, guys, uh, take care over the weekend. Stay safe, and uh, in this period, stay apart. Okay. So. Well, thank you again, John. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone.